you say? Hey Jasper, you look pretty flustered. Can I pour you a drink? Yeah, man. I had no idea what was going on today in Professor Ismore's lecture. What didn't you understand, bro? Zero point vibrational energy and bond dissociation energy? I'm on the same page as you, except that I do know for a fact that it's somehow tied to the kinetic isotope effect according to the, the text. What's the kinetic isotope effect? <sighs> Beats me, man. You know what? Like me. how to tie it to the zero point energy and bond dissociation that Professor Dittmore mentioned in class today. Okay. What else? Is, is it just the... Uh, and uh, we're, not, we're not quite sure how we would use kinetic isotope like, effect. What's the importance? World. I don't even... Why, is, why do we have to learn it? Why do we care about well, it? Well, you guys, the kinetic isotope effect is uh, of great importance in the... mainly in the physical organic chemist... to the physical organic chemist because... Um, uh, it, it, allows, it allows the physical organic chemist to uh, understand the molecular reaction like that. So I'm not sure, I still, I still don't quite understand what you're talking about. I think we must go deeper. Yeah. Well, you know what? Let's go to my lab. I'll explain it. Hey guys, so welcome to the lab. Okay, so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna teach you guys about kinetic isotope effect and uh, relative concepts. Okay, to understand kinetic isotope effect, um, you have to understand these two concepts vibrational zero point energy and bond dissociation energy. Do any of you know what those topics are? Okay. Okay, so it's easiest to explain the vibrational zero point energy of a molecule in terms of a one dimensional harmonic oscillator, where Schrodinger equation is. Okay, we get a second order differential equation that, when solved, we obtain finite solutions with the energy quantized in the form. As you can see here, in the ground state, when n equals zero, we're left with h bar omega times one half. And when graphed, we obtain this. As yes, you can see here, omega is square root of k over mu. Mu is m1 times m2, m1 plus m2. What exactly. Very good. So, but can you give me a, can you give a, a simplified analogy of this whole thing going on? So, how does, how does, okay, how does this equation work, you know? Okay, so, picture this. You have two springs. One of the springs has a heavier mass on it, right? Look, I wasn't thinking about it. Okay, go on. Okay, so now when we plug into our mu, our reduced mass equation, mm -hmm. we're going to have a higher mass, right? Exactly. Reduced mass. Yeah. When we plug it into omega, we have a lower omega. Exactly, because it's in the denominator, right? Yeah. And, and in turn, when we plug into our energy uh -huh. equation, we're going to have a lower energy, which translates to a lower vibrational zero point energy for the heavier one. Ah, oh, I see, I see. You see, so that's where it comes into play. Interesting. Uh, so, and how would this relate to uh, bond dissociation energy? I want to see, do you guys know anything about that? I mean, this does relate to it, the bond association energy. Do you guys know how? Okay, I, see, I think I see how the vibrational zero point energy works, and I think I can tie it into how the bond association energy works. All right, come up here and show us how. So we just calculated the vibrational zero point energies of a carbon, hydrogen, and carbon deuterium bond, which, when graphed, looks something like this. With our deuterium bond being lower than our hydrogen bond. And in terms of energy, our carbon deuterium bond will have a greater energy 
versus our carbon-hydrogen bond. And we have these rate equations for the carbon-hydrogen and carbon-deuterium bond, which are rate constants, you mean? Rate constants, yes. Which, if we calculate out, assuming that AH and AD are equal to each other, we get a value of about 7. And this, this value tells us that the carbon-hydrogen bond is 7 times more likely to dissociate than the carbon-deuterium bond. Alright, yeah, that sounds right, except two things. Um, this ratio basically indicates that the deprotonation is occurring seven times faster than the dedeuteration. And uh, these two lines are, uh, the, these two lines indicate the vibrational zero point energy. Mm -hmm. And uh, these indicate the bond, bond association energy. energy. Kinetic isotope effect uh, uses this ratio. And basically, a ratio between one and seven is considered normal kinetic isotope effect. And uh, a ratio greater than 2 indicates that the uh, deprotonation is the rate determining step. It's a good indication that the deprotonation is a good rate determining step. And uh, a ratio less than 1 indicates, it, it's called the inverse kinetic isotope effect, where dedeuteration is preferred over deprotonation. And there's two types of kinetic isotope effect, primary and secondary. Primary, primary kinetic isotope effect uh, looks at the reaction site, and uh, secondary kinetic isotope effect uh, looks at adjacent carbons, adjacent sites, where the CH bond is actually not... Uh, the CH bond is basically changing length. And uh, it's not that as apparent as a primary kinetic isotope effect, but uh, it's still very useful for um, determining a molecular reaction mechanism. So now you can see that the zero point vibration energy and the bond association energy uh, are used to find the rate constants and uh, how the ratio uh, is used to explain the kinetic isotope effect. Alright, guys, time's running. I gotta get home. Peace. Oh, how you doing? Good, man. I'll get the money. Okay, we're gonna edit that. Need that protein. It didn't out. It didn't out. <laughs>